So the next panel is going to be on international IoT. Um, we, as a firm, are international in the sense that we have uh, offices around the world and people around the world, and some of the things that uh, we see is that there are differences and there's continuity by uh, what's going on internationally, not only from a carrier perspective, but a hardware perspective, eSIMs, uh, mobile security, and all the other pieces behind that. Did we lose someone on the on the way? She's just like getting mic up. Miking up issues. Yep. Okay. Well, I mean that's that's part of uh, live TV here, by the way. Just in case you wanted to know. So what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, each person here is going to take a couple seconds or a couple minutes to uh, talk about who they are, what company they're with, and and how they are involved in international IoT. There she is. Hi. It's fashionably light. It's fashion. Well, you know what, Lisa, it's okay. So that's what we're going to do now, and so without any further ado, Pei, it's all yours. Thank you, Pei Kongman. Um, I'm CEO of a company called Telenabler, who is basically the European arm of Limitless Mobile. Limitless Mobile is a rural carrier in the US, but specialized in enabling both MVNOs and IoT plays here in the US, and we are enabling guys in, in Europe predominantly in, in the Nordics, but basically using that platform in Nordics and, and also Latin. But so it's mostly connectivity. We are not going into any deep system integration. So. Excellent. Okay. Angel? Hey, good afternoon. My name is uh, Angel Mercedes. I'm service manager with Sierra Wireless at Cloud Connectivity Services Group. Uh, Sierra Wireless is a publicly traded company but dedicated 100% to IoT. We are a, leader, a leading provider of uh, fully integrated cloud services uh, for the IoT industry. And uh, we provide uh, embedded modules, uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, and also cellular gateways that we integrate with our cloud and connectivity services. Uh, we have shipped uh, over 130 million embedded modules uh, over the, our 20 year history. There's a windstorm in here somewhere. Or it's, uh, it's all because of us with our hot air that we have. In there. I don't know if it's. No, I don't think it's us. I think it's one of the trade-off ones. So go ahead. So I'm Lisa Umacher. I'm with Vodafone. Uh, we're the largest um, IoT carrier in the world with uh, around about 100 providers on our platform. We offer um, seamless service across the world in 200 countries and over 650 networks. We just make it easy for uh, a company to provide IoT services to their customers or engage with their business globally. Um, we have 1,400 professionals. We have a group here in the US focused on multinational companies. Um, and we maniacally focus on IoT. It's all we do. As I say, I can't sell NPLS because I can't spell it. So IoT. So thank you very much. So you know, I want to talk about international. So I want to ask a Sierra question first. Of all those modules that you have sold, how many are domestic versus international? Uh, I don't know if uh oh. That's not working. Go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, I don't know the exact percentage, but I would guess at least 50% of those modules have yeah, and, I, and, I, and the reason I'm asking that question is to try and figure out where everything is being shipped, right? So how many things are going on internationally versus domestically? Because if you look at the, some of the numbers that have come out, the international markets are growing rapidly compared to the U.S. markets. And, you know, when you see numbers coming out like 20 billion and 50 billion numbers, those numbers are going to come from the international markets. It's not necessarily going to come from the U.S. markets. So one of the things I wanted to ask from a Vodafone scenario is, what are you seeing from a trend standpoint within IoT? Are you seeing companies coming to you, you know, in a specific region within the within the world well, are you saying i want to go everywhere i want to deploy everywhere so i think there's two scenarios the first scenario is a company who starts their business in the u.s and then they say "Ha, huh, who almost speaks english australia new zealand uk and they expand to english-speaking markets and then they expand their product into other markets that are a little more culturally challenging and so that's how they roll out the other is someone who decides that they're going to be global from day one 
and uh, an example would be someone who's testing for viruses in the field. And so wherever that virus um, activity might be at the time, whether it's Zika in um, South America or it's um, yellow fever in Africa, their product um, morphs into the area of activity. So we see both sides of the, this coin. Um, it just depends on the, the, the company and, and what their trajectory is. And do you feel that there's a, uh, Angel, I'm gonna go back to you, uh, from a SIM standpoint, Tell me what you feel about where we are with SIM cards, global SIMs, eSIMs, and how does that affect everything that you're doing from a Sierra Wireless perspective? Sure, so the, the trend that we're seeing is that uh, customers are looking for a SIM that can work uh, globally. Uh, they don't want to sign the, you know, multiple contracts with the mobile network operators. And also, they want to be able, when their SIM card is in a particular country, they want to be able to connect to one more than one mobile network operator. And uh, also lately what we have seen is uh, uh, customers are talking about uh, the eSIM, and that is uh, you know, the SIM that is capable of uh, being reprovisioned uh, and changing subscription for one mobile network operator to another, uh, either the permanent uh, or just uh, you know, switching on and off from, uh, from one operator to another. And from a rural standpoint, large amount of growth. We met with another rural carrier this morning. Uh, it's an amazing opportunity, not only in agriculture, but oil and gas and some of the remote monitoring scenarios. So what are the trends that you're seeing and some of the challenges that are uh, facing you guys? I think that, that uh, one other thing that is, is becoming very clear in the second stage is that, that Europe is not one country. Europe is a lot of countries and there is a new roaming regulation which gives the same price but it's still a lot of operators and a lot of countries. So if you're not working with Vodafone then suddenly you have to work with 20, 30 different operators. You are getting into problem with uh, stationary roaming. Today you can go with quite a few guys who use roaming sims and uh, when now the roaming revenues will go down this will be a free hunting so there will be a lot of shutdowns by people who go on roaming sims instead of national uh, IMSIS or, or, or SIMS. So I think that, that is one of the biggest uh, changes that we will see in the next 12 months, that you have to have national SIMS or work with somebody that is already approved for, for doing that. Do you, uh, a question for you, uh, knowing how you operate today, but narrowband IoT and, and M are here on the IoT side. How does that affect the way you do business? I think it, we, we are not into the, the tech part side in the, in the European market in that sense, but it gives us clear niches so that we can go clearly after, after some niches. As we saw on, on the thing with Richard, it's thousands of different use cases and 20, 30, 40 is good enough for us because it's still millions of SIMs or, or connectivity points in, in those specific vertical market segments. So, so it helps us more to focus than, than anything else. And Lisa, from your standpoint, we have a lot of changes going on. You know, we've lived through, you and I have lived through two and Angel too. I've known these guys a long time. 2G to 4G, you know, we've gone through this. So where are we headed with narrowband IoT and M and everything that's associated with it? And what's your Vodafone stance on it on a worldwide basis? So Vodafone has um, certainly launched narrowband IoT. Yep. We're in that camp at the moment. Um, we have networks launched in Spain, in Ireland, uh, and parts of Europe. So as it's a 4G overlay, it's great to be able to leverage our large LTE global network that we have. Um, do I believe Cat M and NB IoT will live side by side? I, I think they will, um, and I think there's a use case for each. Um, we're really excited by it, partly because of the different shutdowns in the different continents. So 2G is shut down here, but 2G will stay in Europe and 3G will shut down first, so it's very complicated for a customer to make the right choice. So I think narrowband gives a lot of options, um, 4G gives a lot of options, so um, we are firmly in the narrowband camp and we're excited by the low power um, and the uh, in-building penetration and some of the other advantages that um, NBIoT brings to the table. And I think you'll start to see the exponential um, growth into the maybe billions of connections, I don't know, that really feels like an analyst projection to me, yeah. but yeah. I'm sure we're going to get to yeah. a billion, yeah. yes we are. Angel, I'm going to have to put you on the spot a little bit. Recent announcement of the purchase of Numerex. Um, I know, you can smirk if you like, I, and I, I have to do this, I'm sorry. It's not, 
where is that headed uh, from a Sierra Wireless standpoint? Internationally, Numerex is everywhere. You are everywhere. What do you see as a, as a play? Right. And in the case of uh, our acquisition, uh, pending acquisition of Numerex, uh, we actually see uh, that is going to help us even more in U.S. And that's okay. because of the infrastructure that they have in, in U.S. and also the uh, the services that they provide here and the, the revenue. Uh, so uh, that is something that is going to, to help us. But it's going to be mainly in the U.S. That's a, the way I see it. Pai, I'm going to another question for everybody. What is the biggest challenges that you're facing every day uh, in your deployment and Customer acquisition? Is, is it a financial scenario? Is it what? I think it is. I think it is coming back to stay, staying focused and doing some good delivery because there is so many different opportunities, and, and I think you can go really wrong if you take on too many. So I think that that doing a good job on a certain set of, of opportunities and try to stick to that. Um, if you have a success, do that in more countries, but do the same thing. Um, it could seem simple, but I think that is one of the most important things because it's going so quick right now. Is price an issue? Price is definitely an issue, but, but um, it's becoming less of an issue for most of the applications because the packaging, um, together with MRC and so forth, we, we, I think that most of the little bit bigger player can do decent packaging. But of course, if you come up to these guys who wants 5, 10 gig, you have a problem. Yes. They shouldn't be doing IoT. Hey Joel, uh, you've been around a while. What do you see is still? Yes, uh, the same issue that we had since uh, day one is the, uh, the issue that we have today, and that is uh, integrating all these different components. Yep. Uh, in the case of Sierra Wireless, uh, we had these uh, device to cloud solutions that we are, uh, so you can have an easier integration. Uh, and also, uh, you mentioned uh, narrowband IoT and CAT M and, and 2G. So Sierra Wireless is uh, prepared for that, and we actually have uh, one device that can work on, as an MBIoT, uh, CAT M, and also uh, for back to 2G. So a single device that works uh, globally uh, can cover all these uh, different technologies. Lisa, what's the biggest challenge that you're seeing? Uh, I think it's the complexity. It is. I mean, everyone says IoT is simple. It's and not. I've been in IoT a long time, yes, we have. not quite as long as you, but, uh, <laughs> and it's just not simple. Yeah. It's actually quite complex. And I think part of the challenge is to identify what are you looking for in your IoT solution. So really identifying what the customer journey <coughs> is, what's the benefit you're trying to attain, what business model are you trying to change, what efficiency you're trying to gain, and then step back from there and say, how do I get there from here? What's my ROI? Um, and I think a lot of people sort of say, I want to be in IoT. It's like, it's a buzzword, I have to be there. The question is, what are you trying to achieve? And I think when we help un the customers uncover that goal and then step back to figure out how we get there, um, that I think is one of the biggest challenges. And, and as I said in the beginning, uh, when I introduced everybody, you know, well, there's three things that I'm really focused in on. Integration is for sure a big, big issue. There's no one throw at the choke, don't take this personally. It's not Sierra, it's not the NVMe, it's not the carrier, who is it? It's not the large systems integrators who we can't afford normally. So it's gotta be a situation where we have to find out who's gonna do that. The second is education. That's why we're here and that's why we do what we do because we spend a lot of our time educating not only the vendors in the system, but the people that we're trying to sell this stuff to. And then the third piece that I wanna bring up is security and your opinion on it and where we're headed. Uh, you know, are we looking at security being everywhere? We're on, we're in apps. Carriers will tell us, oh, we're secure, so you don't, yeah, it's fine, we'll take care of that. We have situations with modules and putting software on modules to be able to do that. So I wanna ask <coughs> about my next pet peeve, which is security. Well, um, I think that security and, and also personal integrity uh, items will be very much things that, that we haven't even dreamt of. I mean, I've, I've heard numbers, we spoke about it, 70 points per person in the home, and half of them you don't even know that they exist. They are managed by other people, uh, do we know their system and so forth? So I think that somehow there will be some kind of not wanted but needed regulation or, or taking care of certification because it's going to be total mayhem in our own homes or cars or workplace. 
So I think that, that this will be a really, really big issue. I think as Robin was pointing out about the multiple platform scenarios, I mean, it's just out of hand. And it's also from a carrier perspective and a deployment internationally, trying to figure out who has the capability of managing SIMs and, and devices and modules on a worldwide basis on multiple carriers and multi MZs. It's, it's a mess. It's, it's a very difficult thing to go back to that. But what do you feel about, how do you feel about security? Yeah, uh, Sierra Wireless, we take uh, security very seriously. In fact, uh, we have a chief security officer. Uh, we have uh, a group that is just dedicated to uh, security. Uh, and also, uh, when the type of solution that we have, the device to cloud, uh, the more components from Sierra Wireless you use, uh, the more secure it is because uh, we can insert some keys at uh, the factory level. Uh, but even uh, if you're not using the, all the components of Sierra Wireless, uh, we have uh, many different ways that we can uh, improve uh, security. Lisa? Yeah, so we hear our customers who speak to us about security all the time, and they're very nervous. Um, you hear a lot of conference talk about security. So at Vodafone, we have um, taken it very seriously. So we've purposely built our IoT platform isolated from the rest of the consumer world. So it's a built-for-purpose IoT platform that is secure, um, and then the inherent security that comes with the license spectrum and the cellular um, standards and protocols. And then we've layered some security on top of that. So we, too, take it very seriously, especially with applications like finance and healthcare, uh, where you have to have that inherent additional security layer. Um, and we, too, are launching some initiatives around security because we identify that that's a really um, hot button for our customers. And we don't want people hacking into vehicles or hacking into healthcare devices. That's not cool. Um, it's not safe. And it gives the whole industry a, um, a reputation challenge. So we're really focused on helping solve that issue. And do you feel that is a Vodafone responsibility to the end user or to the reseller or the whole nine yards? All of the above. All of the above. I know, true. Are there any questions? Anybody have any questions? I figured what, you know, we might want to ask the first question of the day. All right, then I'll keep going because I have the questions. And that's the same. So if I were to provide you with a seed capital of, say, $10 million, what would you do with my money as it relates to deploying IoT from an international basis? What would you do with my money? I always, have a, I always have a trick question. That was a naughty one. I know. I'm no, I think, I, think that, <laughs> I, think that I, I think that I would try and, and set up a single point of, of um, integration for as many countries or networks as possible, more than we have today, so that I can give what most customers want. Because when you have a customer online, the first time it says, well, which more countries can I get? And then you have another system integration or another version. So, so I would definitely say that more networks on one integration point. Okay. Angel? Uh, I'll probably spend it on uh, some uh, smaller global SIM where the, the customer, the, the device could go anywhere and uh, be able to connect securely, be very secured, and, and also uh, without uh, having to be integrating many different uh, mobile network operators and having many different contracts. I go shopping with your wife. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, you know, it, it's, um, it's an honest, honest answer. answer. You know, I could expect that. That's good. Yeah, we, we could do some damage. For her or yeah, my wife? Your wife. I mean, no. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks. Actually, I think I'd like to invest in some um, development lab kind of environments where we could see some interesting uh, ideas around innovative use cases in IoT. Um, I think um, without necessarily having to have parameters around it. And I'd like to do that globally, and I'd like to do that um, with underdeveloped um, environments where we could really stimulate some growth. Um, I think if you look at M-Pesa in Kenya yeah. and what that did to Kenya and to their culture and their community, um, I think uh, something like an M-Pesa needs to really, really be planted somewhere to drive an IoT story um, success like M-Pesa did for, for banking. You bring up an interesting point about that kind of scenario. Standards, we, we're having a hard time on trying to figure out from an international level where we head with standards. 
what, what could we do to help and who would we go to because we have so many different places. It's, it's not PTCRB, it's you know, who, who is it and how do we address the craziness of standards and sometimes the lack of, especially on the security side, what we're doing there. Any thoughts? Another trick question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, I, I think that, that uh, if we go back to one of the founders here, GSMA, which was kind of the sorting a lot of, of, of these kind of things, maybe something like that, that actually brings in both vendors, users, and, and uh, for that sake, governments, but try to do something. But that's just me whiteboarding. I haven't been sleepless over that. but. I think that GSMA had, had made a lot of good work on the standardization for the traditional mobile industry, which should be maybe mm -hmm. copied. Okay. Angel? Uh, I also think about uh, GSMA, uh, like they had done a pretty good job with the UICC, the, the eSIM, right. and this is probably the one organization that, uh, which uh, all the mobile network operators are uh, members of uh, because uh, you have so, so many different other organizations, but this is the one that is, uh, seems to be uh, pretty much a uh, standard where uh, everybody participates in. Lisa? Yeah, even beyond standards, it's just bands. You know, look at the 4G bands across the world. I know. If you want to have a device that works everywhere, it's got to have, I think um, Dermot will be happy it has to have 27 antennas, right? I mean. It's complicated, and then you throw in on top of that um, narrowband IoT standards haven't been established for roaming yet. So I think you know, GSMA is probably the right venue, but I think there has to be engagement with um, regional bodies as well to see if we can harmonize some of that, because some of the decisions being made country by country um, just don't make any sense if you look at it from a global perspective. Yeah, let's make it more difficult. Let's make it more complicated. Let's make it more complicated, more difficult for vendors, manufacturers, people that are in the ecosystem to try and deploy some of these things. And, and, and God only knows that's the only way we're going to get to 20 billion is making it more complicated yeah. from that standpoint. Right. Um, so pricing seems to be an issue, right? It's all over the place. Um, we're, I was uh, moderating the Mobile IoT Summit in Shanghai a couple of months ago at GSMA. And uh, for the first time ever, I had had a carrier openly admit, uh, now this is on the NBIOT low power side of the world, that they were, we were at a race to zero, right? So now we're getting to the point of we're talking about 67 cents down to 48 cents, down to 24 cents. And the president of China Mobile said on, a, on my panel that he sees one day this, his carrier being able to give it away for free and add value on it to on top of the no cost for airtime in order to get the ARPU numbers back up. Is that a crazy idea? Do we see that you have to have value in order as we go to a race to zero for airtime rates, let alone module rates that are going down to under $10? I don't think it has to go down to zero. You can take a very, very simple benchmark between Sweden and Denmark pretty similar mar markets, but um, the price for SMS was about one-tenth in Denmark versus Sweden. The volume was one to 20 times in Denmark, so the, the revenue stream was larger in Denmark than in Sweden. And if you see the same thing here with the volumes of, of connectivity points we're talking about, so if you drive down the price, you should get, be able to get more points and in total get more, get more right. volume, got more uh, turnover. But I think that, oh, by nature, some of the, of the other guys have a different uh, point on that, but, but I think that the total volume should raise. I think uh, the price has come down, I mean, quite a bit. Uh, I was selling uh, GSM modules back in 2007 for $50 each. Yep. So now you can get an there LTE. There were a lot of us selling yeah. for 50 <laughs> right. And by the way, CDMA was 75, so that was even better. <laughs> so, and. Uh, and now you can uh, you are going to be able to get a cap M device that can work globally and can have MBIOT and 2G for back and is for less than ten dollars. So, and as far as the uh, no cost for the rate plans, I mean this is a plan similar to what some people have been talking about with the auto OEMs, where you will get a vehicle for free and then uh, they will get uh, their money with uh, applications with the connected cards. So. Uh, Yes, I mean, it could, 
you could go to, to zero, but somewhere you had to, somehow you had to get your money back, right? But so. isn't that where Jason and the management team have looked at some of the acquisitions that Sierra has made in order to compensate yourselves for other than the module costs going down by adding more app value and other things to it? Is sure. Is that part of your philosophy? Of course, of course, yeah. The uh, recurring revenue, that's, the, that's, what, that's what we're going after. Yeah. And Lisa? How does, it, how does this affect you guys on the pricing? Um, I think you have to just change the, change the discussion to value. You know, we, we try right. not to have price discussions, we have value discussions, and I think the question is what are you providing to the customer? And if you, you shouldn't really be talking about the cost of a megabyte or a kilobyte or anything else. You should be talking about what is the value of a solution we can bring to you, how are we changing your business model, how are we making you more efficient? And then changing the model from necessarily a traditional subscription model maybe to a very different business model that gets away completely from... Usage-based? Perhaps. Or something even more crazy. Um, so, yeah, I just think it's, it's an what interesting time. Uh, you, I think there's some interesting ways out there to maybe tackle this that go away from the traditional, you know, month-by-month -month subscription um, or paying, you know, for a kilobyte of data. Because really, at the end of the day, who knows how much data they're actually going to use. I mean, if I say to the average customer, how many you know, megabytes are you going to use, and they look at you like you've got three heads, um, I think you'd have to change that conversation. I, I, you're absolutely right. I think that the value that you're getting out of the application and the program, no one really, you know, and it's amazing because we're looking at people, are you adding more data? No, 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 we're using less and less data. And actually, John and I met with a company today. They're saying they're only using 150 kilobits, and he and I are looking at, you, at each other going, you know what, that's, a, that's low and you don't know, so it is a race to zero. Uh, anybody have any questions at all? All right. Yes, sir. Uh, what is your perspective on the, on the uh, low end of the IoT, everything which falls into the mesh, LoRa, Sigfox, technologies? So, Patrice? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so we, um, we look at it as all complementary, actually. So we don't think we'll have every one of the billions and billions of devices. That's crazy talk to think that cellular will provide all of that. So we look and sort of say, what's the best use? So if you're in a warehouse and you want to automate all of your light bulbs in the warehouse, the light lighting fixtures, would you really do a cellular connection into all 6,000 light fixtures? Probably not. Would you do something from a mesh perspective? Yes, that makes perfect sense. So I think it all has a complementary role to play in the IoT ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, Angel? Yeah, same way. I mean, we, we think uh, those uh, technologies are going to be complementary to, to cellular. Are you going to go after those? Nope. nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of why I didn't bring it up, but thank you very much for bringing it up. But I, you know, I kind of I, I understood you would not. I mean, it's, from that standpoint, it makes no sense in your, in your go-to-market strategy. But it doesn't make sense for, anybody, you know, for everybody. So in our closing time, can you give me a little conclusion, a little thought process, a little ending ideas on international IoT, what you would do, what would you suggest to the crowd as to what should be done? I think that, that one of the things you should do is, is you should partner up with any of, of these kind of guys that is in many, many markets, many different environments, so that you're not getting stuck when you, when you grow. And I think uh, try to keep it a bit simple. We spoke about it several times today. It's complicated. You try to resolve 500 things with, with one solution. Maybe do five things, do them good, and then take another five. Take one country first, and then take the second country. So, so that would basically be my view. Excellent. Angel? Yeah, I would recommend you, you do your homework and uh, uh, choose a company that will provide you support uh, globally, not just uh, locally. And also, it would be good uh, to work with a company that can provide you as many part of the uh, solution as possible. Yep. And I would say absolutely find a company who has feet on the street in as many countries as possible so that you have both local support but a global perspective and a single connection, single, you know, I love your analogy, throat to choke. Someone said it's a, a back, back to pat. Um, <laughs> and yeah, just find that company who can provide you with that global perspective with some local presence so that you have the protection of having people locally but the global overview. Excellent. Thank you. Thank the panel, please. Thank you. Appreciate it.